After the Apocalypse, a pandemic survival story. Season 1, Episode 15, Not So Innocent. A sharp wind evaporated the sweat from Janet's arms. She felt a chill like a passing ghost. Her heart settled from a hard drumbeat in her chest to a low, rhythmic thump as she walked, recovering from her run. She felt cleaner now, refreshed. The familiar ache of bone and muscle comforted her. She wiped her eyes with the sleeve of her shirt and looked ahead at the vehicle in the road. What was going on with this overheated camper van? It was an older, boxy model. The hood was propped open and she could smell the metal of the overheated radiator. Janet could hear snippets of argument as she cautiously approached. It was hard to get all of it. The wind was gusting, creating white noise that washed out the voices, making them fade in and out like a bad phone connection. She approached the van on the opposite side from where the people were arguing better to stay unnoticed. Was this even something she wanted to get involved with? She had a choice to make. She could either make her presence known or just keep going. The way they were arguing, they would probably never notice. Or she could make her presence known and see what was going on. Her recent experience, however, had shown that the world she knew had changed. In these dark days after the great dying, people were strange. People were unhinged from the anchors of civilization. People were dangerous. It was in their nature. Threatened, they looked out for themselves, and their basic humanity took a back seat. She heard a woman and a man and pieces of the conversation. I told you something was wrong, the woman seemed to say in a nagging tone. You're the expert now, the man shot back sarcastically. What the hell are we supposed to do now? the woman again. Janet moved into the shadow of the van. The van blocked the conversation and she was getting less of it now, but the tone seemed to be more heated. We had a deal, the man yelled as if to win a point. Then some garbled exchange Janet couldn't catch. Not the girl, the woman clearly yelled. A movement out of the corner of Janet's eye caught her attention. A curtain shifted in the van window, and she thought she saw a small hand. For a moment, Janet thought, Oh, my God, a child in this mess. But then K.J. the killer took over and chimed in coolly, Don't be distracted. Just deal with this problem. K.J. came around the corner of the van just as the man half pushed, half cuffed the woman to the ground. The door to the van was open, and a toolbox lay spilled on the ground. K.J. could have just kept going, but this was a bully, and she hated bullies. Hey, K.J. interjected. The altercation stopped as they both visibly jumped at this intrusion and turned to see who was there. Is there a problem here? She asked matter-of-factly. The man was big, not just fat, which he was as well, but big. One of those solid, fat men who carried their weight like a weapon. He had short, light brown hair and a bald spot and piggish eyes on a small red face. In contrast, the woman was scarecrow skinny in jeans and a flannel shirt with her back against the van. Who the hell are you? The man replied, looking around to see if anyone else was with Janet. All he saw was a woman, alone in the apocalypse. K.J. did not respond but began to circle slowly in a balanced stance like she had been taught. The man gave one last shove and released the woman's shirt from his sausage-fingered grip. You best mind your own business, darling, he said, turning to face Janet. I decide what is my business, K.J. replied in a low voice without emotion. The man looked Janet up and down. He stared into her eyes and smiled a small, smug smile. Never once breaking this fix on Janet, he pulled the scrawny woman up straight like a rag doll and slapped her heart across the face with his free hand. The woman collapsed into the dirt, crying through a split lip. What are you gonna do, sweetie? His smile broadened. You gonna stop me? You gonna kick the big man's ass? But Janet never heard these questions. 
Janet was gone. Only K.J. stood here now, a calmness flowing through her as she settled into the confidence of her hunter-killer persona. This was part of her nature. It had always been part of her nature. When there was a moment of truth in the courtroom or in a game, Janet became a different person. Or more precisely, a window opened on a part of her that was a different person. She shifted into these instances and became the most capable part of herself. Time slowed and everything came into focus. Some people called it the zone. K.J. felt it now. K.J. the killer may have smiled a little bit. She didn't like this man and she was quite certain she could run circles around him. He was an overconfident pig of a man and she wouldn't take it. The scrawny woman sobbing on the ground entreated, Leave her alone, Carl. Yeah, Carl. Janet drawled out his name mockingly. Step back before you get hurt. Carl snapped at the fallen woman. Shut up! Stay out of it! And turned to confront Janet. K.J. circled into only a few feet away. She was ready for him and hoped he would make a charge at her so she could drop him like the piece of filth he was. Why don't you calm down and walk away, Carl? K.J. said in a calm, weighted voice, the one she used to make her opponents doubt themselves. But apparently Carl had an animal nature, too. He stared at Janet, an animal fury behind his eyes. He seemed to come to some decision and lunge for Janet, trying to grab her. K.J. was moving as he took his first step. She was prepared for aggression and pivoted out of his oncoming grasp. She shoved him as he rushed by, leaving him grasping at the air where she used to be. Using his momentum against him, she kicked the back of his leg as he stumbled past. But something was wrong. In her mental movie of that move, it went differently. When she had practiced it with her instructor, his leg had buckled, dropping him hard to the mat. Not this man. He just grunted. He didn't buckle. He didn't budge. It was like kicking a tree trunk. Carl turned quickly for a big man, even angrier now. Once again, the wild fury raged in his eyes. K.J. had overestimated her ability and her advantage over the fat man. He managed to grab at her shirt and pulled her hard, dragging her as he stumbled. His other hand lashed out and grabbed a fistful of her hair, yanking viciously. Shards of pain flashed sharply behind Janet's eyes. K.J. brought her knee up hard, targeting the groin as she had been taught. But Carl seemed to be expecting this and grabbed her knee as it came up, twisting her, lifting her off her feet and slamming her down on her back. The wind was knocked out of her. More than that, she was shocked that she had been knocked down by this man. Panic began to climb up the back of her brain like a poisoned monkey. K.J. ran mental scenarios looking for a way out of this mess. She tried to roll away, looking for anything she could use as a weapon. But the man dropped his weight to pin her to the ground, straddling her, his vicious pig eyes burning with fury over her. Not so tough now, girly, he snarled. She struggled, punching and clawing, trying to find a soft spot. The man grabbed her hands. He was too big to move and too strong to break free of. Then the other woman jumped on his back, attacking from behind, pounding and scratching and screaming like a demented wraith. But even with all of her berserker fury, she was a wisp of a woman and was no more than an annoyance to this bull of a man. Carl lashed out from his kneeling position at the woman on his back, swinging his arm and knocking her back. As he was distracted, K.J. pushed hard with her feet and managed to wriggle free, scrambling away in the dirt like a crab. Just as the animal Kara was turning back to Janet, bang! An explosion rang out. Everything stopped. There was a brief brimstone smell of gunpowder in the air before it was carried away and dissipated by the swirling wind. A stunned K.J. watched as Carl clutched the side of his face, shocked. He pulled his hands away and looked at the blood in amazement. Part of his ear was missing. Blood oozed from the side of his head and he screamed like a stuck pig. A girl, maybe eight years old, lay sprawled in the van doorway with a smoking shotgun as big as herself. The girl lay there, wide-eyed and terrified. Next to Carl, the scrawny woman was screaming uncontrollably, sobbing and wiping Carl's blood from her flannel shirt. KJ used the chaos to get back to her feet. Carl was screaming at the girl now, holding his hand to the side of his head where buckshot had torn into the ear and cheek, and blood was now streaming. But he wasn't out of the fight. If anything, he was even angrier now. 
He struggled to his feet and staggered towards the van door where the girl was sprawled with a gun, looking stunned. You little sh! Carl bellowed. The girl shrank away from him as he approached, a look of sheer terror on her face, like a scared, beaten puppy. KJ was back in a crouch now, and it was her turn to be angry. This guy was an a-hole. This guy had laid hands on her, and now he was going after this child. As her fury surged, she sprang into action like a predator. In one continuous motion, she grabbed the empty toolbox, advanced on Carl, and using her momentum, swung it hard against the back of Carl's head. He dropped into the dirt, semi-conscious like a great limp pig, moaning and bleeding. Janet kicked him with all the anger she could muster. Stay down, a-hole, she said. The woman continued to sob with distress on the ground. K.J. took the shotgun from the girl and pulled the bolt back to expose the remaining shells. She systematically unloaded the weapon, kicked the remaining shells under the van, removed the bolt, tossed the gun aside, and threw the bolt into the woods. Carl moaned some more. K.J. kicked him hard again, wincing a bit as her toe crunched against something hard. K.J. turned to confront the scrawny woman who was sobbing uncontrollably in the dust of the road. Tears and blood streaked muddy lines across her face like a tributaries of a polluted river system. Her hair was matted and wild. K.J. knelt beside the woman, grabbing her by the collar of her shirt and pulled her face in close. Stop it, K.J. said, looking intently into the woman's face. We need your help. The woman continued to sob and looked away. What's your name? K.J. asked. Good grace the woman managed to stammer between sobs. Okay, Grace, do you have any rope or something I can tie Carl up with before he comes to and we have to kick his ass again? KJ smiled a little at this. I, I don't know, came a non-helpful answer. KJ shook her head and gently leaned the woman against the van. Okay, Grace, you're going to have to pull yourself together here. I'll see what I can find. K.J. kicked through the assorted tools in the dirt, pipe, pliers, various wood chisels, drill bits, nails, screws, and a nice big roll of duct tape. The universal tool, that would do it. In a fitting move, she hogtied the big man, taping Carl's wrists and ankles together, leaving him face down in the dirt. Should be good enough for now. Grace had settled down and moved back into the van to comfort the girl. When she emerged, she had cleaned her face and put her hair back. The deep worry lines in her face and her swollen lip made her look old and worn down. Grace considered K.J. for a moment and spoke. What now? Let me ask you that question, Janet shot back. What now for you? What happened here? Grace felt for the van stairs, sat back slowly and looked at her hands. Well, we were all fleeing the city and everyone started dying and I met up with Carl. He offered to take me in the van. He said he was an ex-cop and he knew a place we could go. She trailed off weakly, looking up at Janet and lifting one hand to trace a strand of bangs back with her finger. What about your daughter? Janet asked. Grace looked confused and sad for a moment, but then responded, Oh, you mean Terry? No, She's not my daughter. We picked her up, wandering. Another ad hoc collection of survivors thrown together in the apocalypse, Janet thought. KJ made her way around the hood of the van to inspect the radiator. She found a split in the hose and wrapped it as best she could with duct tape. She rounded the van again to find Grace still seated on the stairs, but now with little Terry Ling snug in her lap. This gave her pause, but just a moment's pause. I filled it back up with creek water, she pointed through the trees. You'll want to keep it topped off, KJ shrugged. This might get you a mile or it might get you 50 miles, I don't know. But it will get you away from here, she said in a tired voice. When it starts to overheat, turn it off and let it cool and add more water if you can. If you keep driving on it, you'll cook the engine. A small voice came from Grace's shoulder. Will you come with us? Terry asked softly, hope and pleading in her little voice. No, K.J. said with a tone of finality. Dead air hung as they waited for an explanation, but K.J. offered none. What about Carl? Grace asked to break the uncomfortable silence. 
K.J. looked at the man who laid face down in the dirt and shrugged. He made his own bed. He can sleep in it. Grace hesitated, unsure. K.J. nodded to the van. Get going now and I'll take care of Carl. Find some place to survive. Find some place for the girl. Grace carried Terry reluctantly into the van and started the engine. She shifted into gear and eased back onto the road. K.J. watched as the van pulled away the face of the young girl looking out the window with haunted eyes. She turned to consider the prone bulk of Carl. What was she going to do with this piece of garbage? She could kill him. She could leave him here to die on his own. She didn't really care either way. She kicked through the scatter of tools and bent to retrieve a box cutter. She pushed back the sleeve to reveal a rusty razor blade and tossed it into the dirt next to Carl's head. Even a dumb pig like him should be able to figure that out. And if he can't, then the world will be a better place anyhow. With that, KJ turned away and resumed walking west. She noticed a slight pain in her toe as she started to jog. She'd have to find some better shoes and some place to hunker down for the night. She thought about this encounter. That was messed up, she decided. She'd have to be more cautious in the future if she wanted to survive. That's all she had to do now. Survive. Hello and welcome back, my survivor friends. How are we all doing? How's the apocalypse treating you? What did you think of the episode? I gotta be honest with you, I struggled writing this one. And my editing team, my, my crack editing team, helped out a lot. Especially Dwayne. Thank you, Dwayne. If anyone wants to help with, you know, writing, editing, that sort of thing, please feel free to reach out. I love the input. So I didn't want to just have action, right? I read a lot of these serial-type stories where it just turns into all action, and the action turns into he, sh he said, she said-type motion without meaning after a while, and that gets boring. There's no stakes, not snakes, stakes. You know, like in vampire stakes, but there's no stakes. And you always have, when you're writing these things, you always have to ask, and answer that question, what are the stakes? What, what, what do we care about here? But on the flip side, you don't want to bulk up too much with exposition and emotions, because that gets boring too. So the key is to marry the exposition and the stakes into the action. Have what the characters do and say make your points for you. So language is a powerful thing. Storytelling is a basic human powerful thing. So long story short, <laughs> pun absolutely intended, I had to wrestle with that in this episode. I wanted to make sure that we were understanding the motivation of the characters and moving the broader narrative forward and even exploring some deeper themes, as pretentious as that sounds. And... As it turns out, this is a common thing, a common theme in apocalyptic literature, right? How does your current pre-apocalypse skill set translate into a post-apocalyptic world? It's not just preppers and backwoodsmen who will do well. It's also other people, people who are resilient, who are fast, who are smart, who are willing to learn, willing to lead. And to show this, we take individuals out of the real world and we drop them into this apocalyptic setting. And in our case, it's Janet, right? Janet's the type A lawyer and the old man who's a disgraced doctor turned ultra runner. And that's the theme that I'm, I'm playing with here. And that's what makes science fiction so much fun because you can create these mashups and play with them. What would a preschool teacher do in an alien invasion? What would the ballet teacher do in an alternate universe? I don't know, but you could write that story, right? It's fun. 
So one of my favorite versions of this, and yours too, I bet, is when Rod Serling did a lot of this in the original Twilight Zone. So one famous episode, he dropped a book-loving bank teller into the apocalypse. Episode 8 of the original Twilight Zone, titled Time Enough at Last. First aired in 1959, based on a story by Lynn Venable. In this episode, Henry Bemis, played by Burgess Meredith, loves books, but is surrounded by those who would prevent him from reading those books. And you know Burgess Meredith. That's the original Penguin in the Batman TV series. And that's Rocky's crusty old coach Mickey in the Rocky movies. In this Twilight Zone episode, if you remember, follows Bemis through a post-apocalyptic world, touching on such social issues as anti-intellectualism, the dangers of relying on technology, and the difference between solitude and loneliness. And the big reveal is that at the end he breaks his reading glasses so he can't read the books even though he's the last one alive. So this was one of the most popular episodes of the original Twilight Zone. And anyhow, that's an example of how you can make an episode compelling without much action at all. Next, we owe some congratulations to all of you, my surviving friends here in the apocalypse. We are over 5,000 downloads strong now. All right, let's push it to a million, huh? (laughs) Tell some friends. Keep the ball moving. Post the link to the show in your social. Do me a favor. You, my friends, are our personal agents of chaos, spreading the apocalypse love. And I do need more of you to join the Patreon page as members. I want to be able to keep the story going, and I need to be able to fund it. I don't need to be able to make money. I just need to be able to not go bankrupt. And you can help me survive with your support. As Patreon members, you get full access to the scripts, uh, the show notes, any audio notes that I'm handing over to Robert for the read, all that stuff. But I'm going to sweeten the pot. I'm going to sweeten the ask. If you go and join Patreon at any level, I'm going to start pushing out members-only episodes. Starting with this one here from one of my other Apocalypse Universes. The haze of acrid smoke hung low over smoldering hulks of cars jammed in the road. They were left scattered and crashed like they had been thrown carelessly by a malevolent giant. So if you want to hear more of stories like that and other stuff that I'm going to drop in, join the Patreon page so I can keep the show going. And Acast has this all automated. So if you join, they'll automatically come onto your feed. Thank you very much. And until next time, keep surviving.